Greetings and welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Bryn Adams, joined by a man who has the magical ability to kick out of a pin after the referee has slapped the canvas three times. It's Mr. Lord Bobgarden. Lauren! <laughs> What's up, Brent Adams? What's going on? How are you? Congratulations to you. Not once, not twice, but three times! <laughs> Spoiler alert, I still have not finished that video. Amazing! <laughs> I know, I'm so I'm so excited to talk about it, but we'll talk about that oh. later. How has your week been, man? There's been lots of Busy. theories on the internet as to what it was you were doing that made us unable to record the show. Uh, my favorite of which was, I think, Star Wars Commander. Yeah, yeah, that, that, was, that was also my favorite theory. Uh, I wish it was something exotic, exciting, and or dangerous. But uh, the truth is that but it was none of those. It was things. grocery shopping. I, I, but you have to understand that it is grocery shopping with a two-year-old who is exceptionally curious about everything and wants to wants to look, wants to touch, wants wants to pick things up. And me, being the parent that I am, I want to engage and and say yes. The, you know, these are bananas, and these are really interesting, and they come from this part of the world, and. Oh, you know, these are pears and nah, they're not, nah, nobody really cares about them. They're sort of diet apples. And then these over here. Are <laughs> and, and then, oh two. my God, it's time to record the show. But anyway, yeah. Are so, we going to discuss the relative merits of pears? <clears throat> There's no relative merits to speak of. So anyway, the point <sighs> is that uh, we got, we got finished. Like we left the house at, I don't know, you know, like 530, hour and a half. And we, we walk out of the store and I look at my phone and it's 10 till seven. I'm like, uh oh. So uh, yeah, just yes. uh, just took a lot longer than I thought it was going to. Yeah, so no, That's so it. no, nothing exotic, nothing. Uh, you know, Brent wasn't being chased through the city, parkouring over buildings. Uh, no, that or, was that was that was Tuesday, but anyway. or uh, or anything exotic like that. But uh, I sorry wasn't for participating the delay. in you know the biggest smackdown that has ever graced the internet <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, no, not at all. But, but we'll uh, get to that. We'll get to so, that. So a little bit of a delay, but we're here now. We're excited to talk about what's going on. We got some good stuff up in the garage. We're excited to talk about the, the what's coming up uh, this year for video games. Yeah, uh, lots of good stuff. So before we get to all that, Lauren, do we want to say anything about next week's show? Which unfortunately, as everybody knows, is our last as a weekly podcast. Although you know, we keep saying that and we assume, and every week we come back, and there's somebody who hasn't listened for a couple of weeks, right? That gets the bad news when we casually mention it. That's true. And then we seem like heartless bastards. Uh, but yes, we can we can uh, talk about next week's show. It is the last official OGR, as you said, Brent. Uh, yeah, the last... Or uh, the official last official weekly. Yeah, the, the last episode is a weekly show, because I, I, I like to say that because it, it doesn't seem quite as sad as just saying it's over, uh, because it's probably not over. I mean, we... we Probably are going to come back and do shows from time to time. Right. That's the. I mean, I, it is. Yeah. It does make it less sad. I agree. But that's. But please know that that's not why. We're not just saying, oh, it's the last show because we can't emotionally deal with it. Although that is also true. Well, I can't emotionally. Uh, deal with it, but, but but I I uh, that's because I have a very sneaking feeling that Brent and I will be doing uh, at least a couple more shows through 2016. Yeah. Uh, if not even more than one or two, I'd uh, be surprised. Just. I, I would be surprised if we didn't do uh, at least a couple episodes when we look at the games that are coming up that you and I are both excited for. We talk about E3. We talk about the advent of virtual reality uh, coming to c- consumer models this year. Um, I ju- it's just not going to be a weekly show. and It's going to be catch as catch can. Yeah, exactly. All right. So anyway, now that we've said that, let's go ahead and move into the garage for this show and before we look ahead, which we're going to do once we get to the clubhouse topic uh, at the most anticipated games of 2016, let's find out what were some of the best selling games of 2015. And we've got some numbers, some MPD numbers for December and, and actually the rest of the year. But it's there's some interesting things in there. Some of it not too surprising, like Call of Duty sold a lot of copies. Not too surprising. But I'll let Lauren run down the numbers for you. Although I got to say, Brent, I, I wouldn't have been... I, I might not have been surprised if it wasn't number one. I, I mean, I, I'm not surprised that it is number one, right? But I, but I might not have been surprised if it wasn't number one this year, just yeah, but, because. I mean, that's like kind of saying like I dropped a bowling ball, and I wasn't really surprised that it hit the ground. I would have been surprised if it had flew straight up, but it didn't. No, no, I mean that's 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 essentially Wait, what you're saying. 
that's a, nothing like what I'm saying at all. That's not even, that's not even remotely an appropriate comparison. Um, you know, Call of Duty has been an annual or two games a year, or four games a year now for, for it feels like 20 years, although it's not been that long. But, uh, yeah. yes, Call of Duty Black Ops 3 was the, uh, uh, number one best-selling game of 2015. Now, uh, it, we're, and it says Xbox One, PS4, 360, PS3, and PC. So the assumption is that uh, it's across all platforms when you're talking about best-selling. Okay. Um, Call of Duty Black Ops 3, followed by Madden NFL 16, followed by Fallout 4. Star Wars Battlefront in fourth place for uh, most games sold in 2015. Grand Theft Auto 5. Which I thought was interesting, Brent. Uh, that that was uh, still high up there on the list. Yeah, well, they uh, did NBA have a PC release this year, so what's that? They did have that PC release this year, and I hear that went okay for them. Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. But it's great to see it that high up. NBA Two K sixteen number six, Minecraft uh, number seven, FIFA sixteen number eight, number nine is Mortal Kombat X, and number ten, the last Call of Duty, Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. What do you know? So Call of Duty twice, bookending the list at 1 and 10. Grand Theft Auto in the middle. Star Wars Battlefront and Fallout 4 uh, doing very well um, with your uh, expected uh, sports games in there and a couple others. So what do you think about these numbers, Brent? Any of these surprises to you? No, I, I have to say that I, I don't think I don't think that there's a lot of surprises in there. I, I think, I, I mean, Grand Theft Auto, as, as you point out, Grand Theft Auto 5, you know, given the fact that that game came out on the, the two consoles... In 2014, saw a PC release this year, and it's it's in the top five. You know that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty cool, I guess. Uh, but outside of that, I don't know. Like, uh, there's nothing here that there's nothing here that I, I found myself really really shocked by. What about Witcher Three? You know, I have to say that in in specific relation to Fallout Four, yes, I am a little surprised because at least at least in my corner of the internet, I can't really see any difference in the level of excitement between something like a Witcher 3 and Fallout 4, which is to say very, very high. But obviously Fallout 4 has a lot of appeal um, among a mainstream audience that apparently The Witcher doesn't. So it, that, that's one of those things that I feel kind of insulated from, just because I guess the people that I talk to, the people I follow on Twitter and that sort of thing, uh, seem to be more in that camp of people that, uh, that were really excited for both Witcher 3 and Fallout 4. But certainly, new, right? But definitely, Fallout has has uh, a wider name recognition. It's also sure. coming hot on the heels of Skyrim, uh, which uh, I think had an even broader audience than um, the Bethesda games from that series, the Elder Scrolls series, than from before. Right. Um, so certainly, it's got the name recognition. But you know, Witcher Three so well reviewed in that same genre, a la Skyrim. Very true. Um, I, I could have seen it on this list. Or what about what about Metal Gear Solid Five, Brent? Metal Gear Solid yes. certainly has a name recognition that that almost no other game has. Yeah, now that that one I I would say is that that is a legitimate surprise that that didn't make it into the top ten. Is that a is that a platform thing, Brent? Is that just you know, well, I mean, does Metal that Gear come Solid down to was multi-platform? So, but was it on the? Was it on the? You know, these games that are that are. Well, I guess Fallout Four wasn't. I was going to say, was it on the, um, the 360 or the PS3? Um, no, it wasn't. Right, but yeah, I'm surprised. A little surprised. Metal Gear Solid's not on here, also. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I, I know that. I, I know we're going to hear from listeners that they're surprised that Star Wars Battlefront is on there, if not because it's a Star Wars game, just because of what they what they perceive the quality of the game to be. That's a, that's actually a really, really good point. Okay, so I take it back. There actually are some there actually are some surprises here. I, I I I said that before we really got into it, but yes, I was surprised that Star Wars Battlefront was as high on this list as it was, particularly given the fact that that it is it has been received as meh as it has been. But again I kind of feel like that's the circles I travel in. I kind of feel like, you know, the people that that you and I talk to on OGR, the people that we talk to on social media, I feel like uh obviously that that circle of friends that uh, that we find ourselves inside of, we're slightly to the the left or whatever of the mainstream in, in terms of of some of these some of these game choices because uh, you know, when you step back and look at it, you're like, well, of course, I mean Star Wars Battlefront, it's a huge game. This is the year Star Wars you know, return to theaters and all this. Stuff. You know, of course, it makes sense that game would be huge, but you know, again, within the pocket of people that we talk to, everybody's kind of like, "Eh, it's all right, but it's nothing to write home about." Yeah, but truth be told, of the top five biggest grossing games, four of them are what I would consider to be 
very sort of mainstream games. Not that people that are more hardcore gamers play them, yeah. don't play them, but oh, yeah, Call, I, of Duty, Call of Duty, Madden, Madden. Yeah, like, Star like, Wars, Grand Theft Auto, those are all very mainstream games. But but uh, more mainstream than The Witcher, more mainstream than Metal Gear Solid. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, it's, interesting to, it's interesting to kind of think about you know the games that we've played and really enjoyed this year, the ones that our listeners have played that we haven't. You know things like Bloodborne, uh, famously, and and to and to see where our where our tastes kind of sit in relation to where the masses are spending their money, which is to say they're better. All right, moving yes, on, Brent. That is to, exactly what we're saying. <laughs> just to the next. I'm not kidding. <laughs> the next item in the garage. Uh, this is a f- fucking weird one. Uh, okay, so. Uh, Squeenix uh, and and IO uh, Interactive changed, basically have come out. The, the, uh, we're talking about Hitman here, which comes out. I'm, I'm stumbling over the words because it's just so weird. The game comes out on March 11th, so we're two months away from launch. And they basically turned the game into an episodic game where it wasn't before. Well, I don't know, but th- th- it seemed like there was always like, they, you remember they talked about it. I mean, like for the first time they announced this game, they they. I don't think they used the words episodic, but they talked about how 2016 would be the year of Hitman and that the game would come out and that there would be continual uh, additions of content that would be coming throughout the year. So they weren't necessarily using the words episodic, but they were what they were describing certainly sounded episodic. But well, but they definitely were painting the picture. Yes, but obviously <laughs> something be a pretty release. fundamental changed. Uh, they canceled. They canceled the pre-orders and said, "You know what? The game has changed so substantially that what you pre-ordered is no longer what's coming out." And uh, and so now we uh, we know a little bit more about what is coming out. So it is now a fully episodic AAA game, as you say. And the first piece, which they're calling the intro pack comes out on march 11th this is going to be uh the uh a prologue mission and the paris location that we've seen shown off in uh in several gameplay walkthroughs italy comes online in april morocco in may and then after that you're going to see monthly content updates including three additional locations which uh, we know are thailand the united states and japan and then um the the season as they're referring to it uh concludes later this year uh with with the Japan content that comes out. So uh in addition to in addition to to those missions which you know feature the gameplay that they've shown off so far, there's also a major live component. Uh you're going to be able to perform contract hits and the pricing model I think is where we want to kind of get to because this is where it gets interesting. Confu- inter- interesting. Is that a euphemism for confusing? You can buy the full thing for $60 at launch. And that'll get you everything that's going to come out this year. So no more than you'd pay for a typical game. But mm-hmm. you're not going to be able to play it as fast as you, as you want to. And that's not too dissimilar from something like The Walking Dead, except except in the amount of money you're paying for. But, you know, right, yeah. that's that's kind of an established thing. Here's right, but you can pay for the entire experience ahead of time. If you want to. Right now, yep. if you want to pay as you go, as we said, it's $15 US for the intro pack. And then the subsequent locations are going to be priced at $10 each. You can also get the intro pack. And then if you want to, you can get the full experience for $50. So it'll cost you $5 more than if you just bought it for the 60 doesn't save you any money from buying, unless there's other content, because they're saying it's $10 per location after the intro pack, right? which is Italy, Morocco, Thailand, U.S., and Japan. So there's five locations. So it, it doesn't seem, at least uh, on the face of it right now, that there's any benefit to, to doing purchasing that. the upgrade right. pack for 50 bucks instead of just paying 10 bucks each time. Unless, unless there's some content, unless maybe there's some sort of content that's included with the full experience. That's different from buying each pack. That, correct, but they Which, have they haven't specified that, or, or, li- or at least they're not talking about it in this article. Maybe maybe it's been mentioned elsewhere. Right. Okay. So in addition to those options, you can also wait at the uh, at the end of the year. You'll be able to buy the full experience on disc, and and you just play it as you would a normal game. But you got to wait until every episode comes out. So yes, it's a little convoluted. I'll grant you. But there's some things about this that I really like. Number one, I like the idea 
that because because I'm I'm interested in this Hitman game. I like a lot of the things that they've shown, a lot of the things that they've talked about. There's pieces of this that I, I feel like I could really get excited about. And I like the idea that I could get into the game for fifteen dollars, play it, see what I think about it, and then decide whether or not I want to continue to support it or not. And uh and there's a quality to that I'm very, very down for. And and not and not a demo, you know, not like a demo level that uh, w- which would be free, granted. But you know, a demo is going to be like really, really tuned, and it's you know, it'll have been the thing that everybody's played dozens and dozens of times, and then the full game comes out, and you're like, okay, well, yeah, that that demo level was great, but then you know, the actual game starts to suffer. I, I, I do like the idea that you can you can play the actual finished product for not too much of a buy-in, fifteen bucks, and then decide whether you want to you want to keep s- spending the money to get to these new locations. And I think that I think that like spacing them a month apart, I think that's a good idea too. I, I think that uh, I, th- I think that that's a it's a reasonable time frame to like play the game, you know, get through it, have some replay value to it before you decide whether you want to move on to the next thing. Yeah, I mean, maybe you're done with it at that point. Maybe you're like, ah, it's a little repetitive. I don't care. A new location is not going to change my issues with the game. That kind of thing. So. I don't know. I I I know that I know some people on our on our website have said that uh, they feel like, you know, this is this is just a big money grab and that it's uh, it's going to, it, it's it's just to facilitate, you know, like ripping people off to some degree or another. But I I don't feel that way right now. Maybe I'll feel that way once the game comes out and we kind of see what the quality is and how the reviews and everything are. But frankly, I I I remain interested in this and. I think that the pricing model actually might have some benefit to it. Yeah, it's interesting, Brent, for sure. I mean, uh, number one, as far as a money grab goes, I'm not, I don't know that I'm sold on that because it, at the end of the day, if you bought it into all of their content, it, the best case scenario for, for them is you, don't, you buy all their content one at a time or whatever, and you, but you yeah. only end up paying an extra five bucks, which isn't a lot of money. And I'm, I, my guess is they're going to lose more people over the course of the episodes then they will gain on the extra five dollars. I mean, the people that really I'd be want the hitman, you're right? Yeah, th- they're probably going to pay the sixty bucks up front, so they're not going to make extra money. Uh, cer- certainly, some people will play it and love it and and buy it, but there's also, I think, probably plenty of people who will play it and either not like it or just sort of peter off and lose interest as the year goes on or whatever, and maybe don't buy even if it's just that very last content pack or one of them in the middle. Um, you know that that they they don't uh, they don't buy that, and suddenly they're not. It's not a money grab anymore, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not like multiplayer DLC where if you want to play all the maps that everyone's playing on, you have to get it. You could ostensibly skip the you know the Italy one just because you were doing something else when it came out, and then pick and not back necessarily up and get the Morocco one, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so, so I'm not. I don't know if it would end up being a money grab. The other thing that I think is really interesting, Brent, is you and I talked have talked for a long, long time at the beginning of of our show together uh, uh, in the Axe Factor about wanting to see more episodic content yeah. uh, because we felt like the medium would be so good for it. And I have to say now, five years later, that I don't know if I feel that way. And, and I don't know what your experience has been, but almost all of the episodic content that I have played, I have not played episodically. Um, it's same, I same with me. Yeah, I haven't played it like every month when it comes out. I tend to play the first one, like it or not, and then wait for the rest to come out. <laughs> yeah. And then play them all I'm, at once. I'm the exact same way. I'm the exact Partially same because way. I just lose track of when they're coming out. Partially because yeah. there is something to like having to relearn the controls every month, basically, um, for that particular game. It you know takes it just yeah. takes a little bit to get back into it. Um, That's but I, true. I, mostly, I think it's because I, I kind of forget about it, and so I, I don't know now. Yeah, that, I know. That's my. Problem. I know. I was a big advocate, at, you know, five years ago, of the idea of it because there wasn't much of it, and I thought it would work well. Um, although to be honest, I, I, I kind of like the once a week thing, like a TV show, which means basically you would have to make it ahead of time and then, you know, just release it Parse on a different it out, schedule. Yeah. Um, it, it is strange though. I mean, cause what you're saying like really rings true to me as well. I, I've, I, I've bought a lot of episodic games that I've not played episodically. The closest one I came to playing episodically was the wolf among us. I think I played, I want to say the first three episodes of that as they came out and then waited and, and, and finished the whole thing later. But uh, like with both of the Walking Dead's, you know, like played like the first episode and then you know waited and did the whole thing in one sitting, and and I, but I'm not exactly sure why that is. I mean, like I don't have any problem keeping up with television shows that way. Uh, like tonight, Star Wars Rebels comes back for mid season break tonight. I could not be more excited. Um, but I don't have that. I don't have that same. 
thing you know with uh with video games like 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 you're saying like I typically just forget that the new episode is is dropped and, and to go get it and I don't know like I really like the idea of episodic content with games I really really do and yet somehow I I don't find maybe something in the execution or maybe the marketing of it or whatever uh I, I don't find myself actually engaged with it when when it's in front of me yeah and the other thing I I would point out Brent uh, that you mentioned, and, and and I have to wonder uh, what was the whole idea of a demo. And demos have uh, have gone by the wayside in, in modern games for almost well, the most part. Oh, yeah, which I don't. Yeah, I mean now they call them betas and alpha tests. Right. And, so like, there is a beta for this, by the way. We'll just throw that out there. There's a PS4 beta that starts February 12th, and a PC beta on the 19th. If you're interested. Um, but I, this kind of content, I, I think, also might contribute to the. Um, the loss of the of the of the true demo. Do you know what I mean? Where right. where if they say, well, you can just get in for fifteen bucks, check it out, test it out, see if you like it. Then you're paying. So there's no reason for us to do a demo. Right. You're paying fifteen dollars essentially for a demo. That's a fair point. Yeah. Right. Which I and which I think point. in our industry is is uh, has been is a bad direction. I, I well, wish that we still did demos. I agree um, with you, but I mean, let let's be honest with you. Betas are demos. I mean, they call they call them betas, but it's just a demo by another name. For, yeah, for the for the, yeah for the most part, I would agree with that. Now, yeah, I mean, c- certainly that's that that's the case. But not not all that many games have betas. This one does, but uh, mostly multiplayer games have betas. Sure. Um, and so you get like an Uncharted, or whatever. You don't get demos for these types of games, and for people, you know, want to see if this game is for them. No, but, but you anyway, do, you do just... get an Uncharted multiplayer beta. Oh, that's true. You do. Yes, yeah. that's right. I and, forgot. And that's the thing. I mean, you know, like I played you know, it. <laughs> that's right. You know, the, the, and I forgot the betas. Uh, you know, the betas are, are simultaneous. It's, it's a marketing thing. It's uh, it's it's a demo kind of thing. And yeah, I'm sure that they get some. I'm sure they get some some data from it that oh, that, certainly that helps them. You know, put things in place. But um, absolutely, they do. The, yeah, I participated in the Battlefront beta, and and absolutely, things changed between the beta. And when the game went live, I mean, and I'm, I would expect it to be the same in Uncharted, but sure. Uh, so yeah, Hitman episodic now. All right, all right. So next up, Brent, uh, this is the this is Philadelphia trailer. Uh, it's a PS4 in this case trailer, but it's called This Is Philadelphia. It's a trailer for Homefront: The Revolution, right? Which comes out on May seventeenth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to know, Brent, how you felt when you watched this trailer. Uh, I felt like I would have much rather seen an actual trailer or like a dev like a dev diary walkthrough instead of this, which is like trying to kind of be both or something like on the one hand, it like it's a narrative trailer in the sense that the, the person speaking, the narrator is, is a character within the game world and is talking about things from the perspective of the, uh, the game's characters and narrative, but they're showing off game mechanics and things like that while they're talking and like it feels like it's trying to kind of have it i don't know like both ways or something i don't think as i don't think this is very good as a trailer uh i i think that either you want to just go ahead and go for the you know quick edit shooty shooty blow up exciting trailer or you want to do the more sort of dev diary walkthrough where you're actually showing off game mechanics and what it's like to play the game and, and somehow i felt like this was trying to be both in some way and didn't think that it came together all that well. I, I I was not excited about the trailer, although I still do remain interested in the game. Yeah, I you know what really bothered me about this trailer, Brent, was that the sort of the the hook for these home front games, right? It's Red Dawn. Yeah. That's that's sort of that's the hook. That's is the that hook. is that yeah. we're fighting on on American soil? We've been invaded, and, and, and that's different. Yeah, for the most part. Not there's not other games. That haven't done it. The Call of Duty series has done it, but this game centers around that, mm-hmm. and that's supposed to be the sort of narrative hook. And by the time I was done with this trailer, I felt like it was, you know, uh, action game trailer A or action game trailer B that could have been any game. I got no sense of what makes this game any different than any other game. As a matter of fact, it felt like yeah, good point. they had just gone to every trope that you expect to see in a, in a, in a you know, uh, uh, an FPS from the last five right. years. And just made sure that they hit all of those notes, and it yeah. felt completely banal. It was not; it just was completely uninteresting, and did nothing to show me why this game is in any way even as interesting as others out there in this genre. And I, I'll continue to watch the game because I'm familiar with content outside of this series, yeah, uh, like Red Dawn that intrigues me, and so I'll watch it. But 
uh, this this uh, I, I just I thought it was a, a poorly put together trailer and does nothing to to um, pique my interest in the game. I totally agree with that. All right, so what about this? Uh, what about this next piece of media? Did this do anything to pique your interest? This <laughs> absolutely did, and I'm very curious to know if it did yours. This is a, a trailer called uh, for a game called Escape from Tarkov. I, I had you heard of this game before nope. I sent I put, sent you this trailer. No, this is this is my first exposure to it. Me too. And someone had posted it, and forgive me, I don't remember who, but some, one of the listeners had posted it on uh, the uh, OGS uh, website. But uh, Escape from Tarkov, it, the the video is called "Meet the New Day Z: Escape from Tarkov Gameplay Details and Walkthrough of Multiplayer Features." And it's actually I can't remember the name of the guy who does it, but it's from Open World Games. Yeah. Um, uh, and he's 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 kind of funny, but he's he's got a lot, his channel has a lot about you know in general about open world games and right. uh, I, I, Brand. I thought I mean it, it looked like uh, an updated awesome version of DayZ with markedly better graphics. Um, I haven't played DayZ. I haven't played the standalone DayZ in in at, at least nine months, right. if not yes. more. So there there might be some there might be some improvements there, but. Certainly, and what I was going to say was this what looks looked like good. markedly better graphics to me and markedly better um, inventory management. There's also, I think, a bit more of RPG elements to it. Yeah. But there is also a single-player component to it, right. I believe. Well, it, um, like that's, that's one thing or, that I'm, no, I'm not clear on how it exactly is going to work out. Not a single-player. That's like, a actually, co- that's, like a co-op. Well, the, it's like, like what like I understood versus was... Versus AI as opposed to it, PvP it's almost like It's almost like... Uh, uh, and I hate to say this, but it's almost like the division in that there is like the equivalent of what are the dark zones in the division. So there's yeah. areas in which you it's permadeath and you lose everything, but right. there's also areas in which it's not necessary. Yeah, well, the the, the comparisons to the division happen several times throughout this this seven minute uh, uh, gameplay footage, which is interesting comparing it to a game that's not out. That's not yet. out yet, right? But <laughs> right, but. Uh, assu- so it's not really a great frame of reference for many people. <laughs> right, exactly. But uh, assuming that all those things are, are true, and if you are, if you're really keeping up with the division and very familiar with those mechanics, then I, I guess maybe that is somewhat helpful. But yeah, I, I, I get the, I get the feeling. Although I don't know if it's like I don't know if it's going to be certain regions of the map or how exactly that's going to be delineated. But it seems like the game is going to, it's going to try to cater to people who really want that hardcore PvP experience. People who are more interested in a co-op experience versus AI opponents, and and you know, they talk about the NPCs in the game and how some of those things are going to work. Like you know, you can die, but the NPCs aren't going to uh, raid your inventory the way that uh, will happen in PvP. And uh, and and one of the things that I thought was really interesting towards the end, they talk about the uh, the merchant system and how it, you know if you want to, you it sounds like you have to complete missions for NPCs to to do certain things, but uh, you can, um, if you want to, you can basically set up your own store in the game, and you can just uh, you can just play the game through its its uh its trading its mechanics trading system. And, yeah. and the, another thing that really really hit hard was the uh, the weapon crafting. Weapon crafting and customization is supposed to be very very deep. So did this interest you, Brent? I mean, does, does, it, it does. I, I, like, I mean, you were insane for Daisy for a while. I was, but I mean, like you know, the difference. Like I, as was I. I, I. I think. I think the 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 first thing to kind of say as far as comparing this to Daisy is there's no fucking zombies in this game that we've seen so yes. far. Yeah, so far. Uh, I mean, you may, maybe there's some there, but I mean, as of right now, it looks like there's been, you know, like like a war in in this place Tarkov, and you know, that's that's the thing that has is kind of decimated everything. It's no like zombie outbreak. So no zombies number one, but I think that the, I think the primary thing that makes this comparable to DayZ is the survival aspect. You're going to have to deal with hunger. You're going to have to deal with exhaustion, uh, thirst, cold. Uh, you know all of those things that make for a kind of a survival simulator experience. That's going to be here. So it's not going to be you know just another multiplayer FPS. It uh, I, I I really do think that it it kind of builds on. The PvP experience that a lot of people got out of DayZ, you know, none of them. There, there were tons of people who played that game that you know didn't really give a crap about kind of like the zombie survival aspect of it. It was just you know for that 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 sort of interesting PvP mechanic that took place within a survival simulator. And it seems like Tarkov is taking that idea and run with it. Yeah, you and I bo- both were crazy for DayZ, but at different times. Very true. Uh, yeah. And so so maybe uh, I, I'm 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 excited just from this uh 
this exposure to Escape from Tarkov for what um, what the game potentially holds in the future. I'm excited to see more about it. And perhaps this is one that, that you and I will end up getting into together. Look, the only thing I want to get in together with you is a tiny little swimming pool and a bunch of baby oil and find out who the best wrestler really is. <laughs> All right? I am, I am so glad that ended in wrestling. Because <laughs> that's not where I thought that was going. All right, guys, we're in the clubhouse now. And before we get into the topic of the week, as usual, we have a poll to go over. Brant, why don't you go over your poll? I would love to. Uh, so the question was, is the Oculus Rift too expensive? Of course, Oculus announced that uh, the Rift is going to cost you uh, $600. 599 uh, Okay, I stand corrected. And so we just want to know, <laughs> is that too much money? Here's how it shook out. Last place, 26% of the vote, you said, I still don't care about VR. 33% said, Odin's beard, yes, Facebook needs to learn. That game hardware gets sold at a loss. More on that in a second. 41% of you with the number one answer said, not at all. The early adopters are already adopting, and the price will fall. Thank you very much for voting in that poll. Thank you also to those of you who pointed out to me that in the uh, the Reddit uh, AMA that Palmer Lucky did, he did in fact state that they are already selling the Oculus Rift at a loss. And, uh, and that's what I get for writing the poll prior to reading that thread in its entirety. So you skim, and this is what happens to you. So anyway, uh, just wanted to uh, make that one correction. However, the happy part of this is it has given me the, the title for the, uh, the new podcast that I'm going to be doing once, uh, once OGR slows down, and that is Your Foot, My Mouth, Let's Do This. Um, <laughs> oh, it's a podcast about sex. I get it. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> So anyway, uh, but thank you guys very much for uh, for voting in that poll and uh, letting your voices be heard on the Oculus pricing. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what the Vive pricing is, given some of the rumors that have been floating around. Uh, I think I think the highest I've seen it right now is what fifteen hundred dollars. Some people, yeah, are estimating. that's that has got to be so far on the extreme end. But yes, uh, there's a lot of talk out there. There's been some breakdowns about what the, you know how people think the cost of the parts of the Rift are versus the parts of the yeah. of the Vive and all that. They HTC uh, has said that they'll be announcing the price on the 29th of February. Um, uh, Brent and I were just talking about uh, you know doing maybe a show around that time once we have the price for the Vive and just talking about what the future of VR looks like. Yep. Uh, maybe doing a little something up around that time, but yeah, they're announcing on the 29th of February. There's there's a, um, a Valve software showcase coming up in next week um, around VR specifically. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting, man. It'll be interesting. I mean, Oculus has stated very clearly that they're taking a loss. Uh, a lot of the ire that came up immediately has sort of died down as people um, sort of settled into what the price was and and well, I, are not I think no longer rumors, basing on their expectations but i think the rumors around the htc5 quieted things down quite a bit they're like oh yeah we think this is going to cost fifteen hundred dollars and they're like six hundred is such a bargain <laughs> yeah i'll be surprised if that's the case man i, I wouldn't be surprised if i wouldn't be surprised if the, if surprised if the vibe comes in around the same price or maybe just a couple hundred dollars more yeah um i, th- I would I be think shocked if it was under upwards a thousand of- i think they've got to be under a thousand if they want to be it, I can't. If they want I just can't see chance. why they would cost more than a thousand. What they're doing that would yeah. cause them to cost more than a thousand, with, with with one exception, and that is well, we don't really it ships know. With two like red 4K cameras, or you know, it might. Whatever. It does ship, ship with two lighthouses and the and the um, the uh, Oculus, you know, um, motion controllers. But yeah. but uh, the the one sort of real unknown is we don't know how much of a loss, quote unquote. Um, because we're taking them at their word. Not the What's Oculus that? controllers. The uh, the HTC. Controllers. The motion controllers. Yeah, the yeah motion they're motion controllers. controllers. Yeah. Um, we don't know how much of a loss uh, Oculus is taking on their unit and how much Facebook is actually subsidizing it. And HTC, uh, it doesn't seem, has those kind of pockets no, uh, to, for that don't. sort of subsidy. And so that could be a big difference maker. Um, That's true. But uh, a lot of people have said, you know, the HTC seems to be, you know, struggling a bit right now. They really need the Vive to, they, they need the Vive to hit and hit hard if they want to, uh, if they want to keep going with it, otherwise they might be spinning that off and selling it to somebody. There's also a lot of rumors right now about the HTC Vive Pre, which is a unit they were showing. It's their DK2. Yeah. The unit they were showing at CES actually being the unit that's going to be available for sale um, as of April 1st. Right. Um, and that, that it's not going to really be their consumer version. There's a, there's a lot of question marks right now, but we'll know in just over a month. And, and when that happens, uh, hopefully we'll get the opportunity to talk about it. 
All right. Uh, all right, Brent. So for our topic this week, we thought we would dive deeper in. It is still early in, in the year. It's the third week of January, and we thought we'd dive a little deeper into our most anticipated games of 2016. Now, uh, we did talk about this a little bit uh, when we did our games of the year in 2015, but we thought we'd get a little deeper into it. And Brent, I've set up the list to be chronological. Right. Uh, there is a lot of stuff here. A lot uh, of stuff. More than I thought there would be in the first four months of the year, um, which is great. As, as a matter of fact, I would, I would dare say that I'm more excited about the first few months of the year than I am the last few months of the year, at least right now. I mean, there's undoubtedly things that we've left off this list, you know, things, things that are you know, coming out that, uh, sometime this year that we maybe don't have a, a release date for yet. But uh, I got to tell you that there is a lot of stuff in, in the, uh, there's a lot of stuff in the next like two weeks. I know, which I'm is incredible. Really excited about. Just to level set, these are our most anticipated games. These aren't um, does, aren't inclusive of all the games that are coming out. There's games that aren't on here that you know, like Crackdown Three, that you know, Brent and I aren't necessarily that excited for. These are specifically yeah. your and my most anticipated games, with with the caveat that neither one of us have an Xbox One or a Wii U, um, and of course, there might be other games to come. But Brent, why don't we just start at the top? Uh, with uh, a game coming out next week, January 26th, coming from Jonathan Blow, uh, maker of the game Braid. His next up uh, title for all of us to enjoy comes out. is called The Witness. Yeah, I was actually, I was just talking about The, the Witness on uh, on Twitter, and, uh, you know, the pre-order started today for that, and it's uh, it's 40 bucks US on Steam, and I, I can't tell you, like, I can't tell you how hardcore I was fighting the urge to uh, to pre-purchase it, I'm to like, pre-order. No, don't do it! Don't do it! Don't do but, it! Like, oh god, I want it to unlock as soon as it's possible to unlock it and start playing immediately because I'm really excited about the witness. I I love I like puzzle games in general, and uh, and and I've I've got a lot of respect for Jonathan Blow as I, I think many of us do. He's a he's a very very talented, very smart guy, and I, I love the idea of this game. I I, I love just the just the you know the, the premise of being set loose on this island with all these really interesting puzzles and you know trying to kind of piece together you know you know what what, what does it all mean like what's sort of the you know the, the question the mystery underlying all of it why does the island exist so on and so forth uh, I'm very I'm very very down for this one so uh, yeah I'm I'm gonna wait I'm not gonna pre-order it but do you think you're gonna get it next week though I think I probably will yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited. Uh, unless unless the reviews come out, you, you know, like I'll I'll go over, I'll check out OpenCritic.com, I'll see what people are saying about it, and uh, and if, uh, if if the word looks good, then I'm definitely going to get it. Unless there's like you know some catastrophic thing where everybody's like, oh right. my everybody's god, everybody's giving it a fifty, saying it just sucks. You know, unless s- s- short of that, though, yes, I'll be getting it w- next week. Yeah, I uh, I'm also excited for the game, but I think I'm going to hold off on it. There's there's a games coming out just a week or two later that I'm very excited about. Uh, and, and two of them, as a matter of fact. And so I think I'm going to hold off on it because there are rumblings about The Witness uh, supporting VR. There's no, been, not been any official announcements yet. Yeah. Jonathan Blow has, has stated in September of last year that he was playing around with it. He was experimenting with it. Um, Valve recently said they're convinced that he's going to do it, although nobody's made an official statement. Yeah. And so there's, there's, a, there's a big piece of me that wants to wait and uh, potentially I- I experience this in VR. So I'm going to hold off. Uh, I think, and, and just wait until the first, you know, second week of February when a couple of other games I'm excited about come off, come out. But uh, <laughs> what, very, what very, would those other games in February be, Lauren? Uh, well, we're almost there, but we can't quite get there yet, Brent, because before that, so that was January 26th. Okay, February 5th, a scant two weeks from now, uh, we have uh, what I I think very potentially could be XCOM a game of the year two! contender. Just for- <laughs> say it, it's XCOM two, Lauren. <laughs> for you, which is XCOM two. <laughs> I, uh, in case you guys didn't understand that, I'm pretty excited. I'm pretty excited. Will you be getting this game day one, Brent? Uh, yeah. Well, okay. So here's the thing: if there is if there is a, a game on this list that I would probably feel comfortable pre-ordering, and and doing so on the basis of, you know, same dev did the last game, one of my favorite games of all time. Uh. Therefore, you know, I'm willing to take the chance and, and go ahead and do it. it. It would be XCOM 2. XCOM 2 is maybe the one game on this list, other than Uncharted 4, that I would be willing to step out on that tree limb and do it. Having said that, you know, I really want to try to stay true to the principle and, and wait for the game to actually come out before I buy it. You know, see, you know, 
see what the reviews are and everything, and, and you would not reward them for making a broken game. It's just that I find it really, really difficult to believe that XCOM 2 is going to be a broken game. So I'm not committing, as opposed to The Witness, where I'm saying, yes, I will definitely not pre-order this. I'm not going to pre-order XCOM 2, but I won't guarantee that I don't, that I don't buy it the moment that it goes on sale. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me either. I, do, I have no idea what the review embargo is. I didn't look it up, but yeah, uh, yeah I, I assume that was going to be a day one purchase for you, yeah. uh, at least. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, so, that. com- so that's February 5th. Coming on February 9th, just four days later, we have two titles, both of which I am very excited about. My, I anticipate at this point purchasing both of those day one. Yep. Uh, not pre-ordering, but purchasing them day one. And that is, the first one is Unravel, uh, which is that sort of super cute side-scrolling platformer with Yarny, the red yarn guy. Yep. Uh, that that swings from his yarn and and uh, goes through all the Scandinavian countryside. Uh, I'm very excited about that game coming out on February 9th. And the second one, Brent, I know you and I are both very very excited about. Also, Firewatch. is Firewatch. Oh yeah, yeah. That that looks great. Can't can't wait for that. I, I mean, so like right there, bam, bam, bam. There's there's three games right there that uh, that well that that are all going to basically be day one purchases for me. Some you know catastrophe notwithstanding. Yep. Uh, I'm very, I'm very excited about both those games, but two indie games, uh, g- gorgeous looking. I'm very, we've talked a lot about Firewatch, uh, uh, on this, um, show, uh, there will be a disc based version of Firewatch. I don't know if there will be one for unravel. And there's also a video out there, by the way, for those of you that don't know, uh, on how to make your own Yarny at home. I saw that. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of, which is very cool. Um, and, and also for those of you that are listening and not necessarily listening, uh, through the post on our website of the show we did put um uh trailers or gameplay videos for every game we're talking about in this section yeah so if you want to head to the website and look at the show post there's trailers or gameplay videos for every single thing we talk about uh in the most anticipated of 2016 so that's those two games february 9th brent all right so and but uh, we've also got that new uh before February closes out, you got the new Far Cry Primal. Two weeks later. Two weeks later. February 23rd. February 23rd, Far Cry Primal comes out. So, what's, like, where are you with that right now? I mean, like, I'm not, I haven't played Far Cry like you have. I, I'm, I'm mildly interested in the, in the series. What's your read on Far Cry Primal? You think, you think that's one that you're going to, you're going to pick up? You're going to wait and see what people say about it? Well, so here's, here's how I shake out on that. So, Far Cry 3, I absolutely loved. Uh, really, really enjoyed Far Cry uh, Blood Dragon. Uh, completely loved. Yes, obviously. As did I. Uh, Far Cry Four, which I was super excited about, particularly because of the Himalayan setting. Uh, I ended up kind of being somewhat cool on because it felt a bit samey to me. Even though there were things that were different, and it was upgraded graphically. They added the gyrocopter, but it still felt very samey to me. And so I think I probably got about halfway through that game, and have never gone back and finished that game. Right. So Far Cry Primal, uh, I am also a little bit cool on, despite the fact that it is a markedly different sort of mechanism. There's also a lot about, about it that looks very much the same. So uh, where I am on Far Cry Primal is essentially that uh, I'm going to have to wait and see, uh, once it comes out, what the reviews say. I, I, I loved Far Cry 3 and Blood Dragon. Uh, I was kind of cool on Far Cry 4. If, if Far Cry Primal is received very, very well... Um, I think I would be inclined to play it. I, I think it's interesting. I think if they tweak the mechanics enough, uh, it could be fresh enough. Um, Setting-wise, certainly, I, I can't think of a game in any in recent history, if at all, that I've played in this setting. Um, yeah, same here. So I, I'm intrigued, but but I'm definitely definitely just kind of waiting to see how it shakes out. But if it shakes out well, I could end up buying it. Yeah, my attitude on it, I, I'm somewhat interested in it, mostly for the setting. But again, I don't have like I don't have sort of a deep connection to Far Cry as a series, and I kind of feel as though what I'm waiting on is I'm waiting to kind of be sold by the reviews, as opposed to something like XCOM Two or The Witness, where I'm basically just waiting for the reviews to give me the go ahead to say, "Yep, the game is not fundamentally broken, and and uh, you know it, it, it's it's all good." And I'll go ahead and snap it up. I'm kind of like waiting on the reviews to tell me Far Cry Primal is the most unlikely game of the year you'll play this year. You know, something like that. That's the kind of thing that I'm. I'm sort of. Uh, I'm not sold on Far Cry Primal yet, but I'm open to it. And and honestly, I mean, that's kind of where I am with the Division, which is the next game on the list. It comes out to March 8th. Uh, a very long, troubled history this game has had. Of course, early, early on, you and I were super, super excited about it, and uh, and it certainly. 
it, it's certainly been downgraded from what they were originally selling. But having said that, I do remain interested in the game. There's certainly some aspect. I, I'm I'm more interested in co-op uh, and and what can be done in the game in co-op as opposed to PvP, which I know is some people's bread and butter. But I do remain interested in the division. That there's some part of me that hopes, even though it's not what we were originally excited about it being, that there that there could possibly be some uh, some fun to be had here. So that's another one that I kind of feel like you know if if the reviews are really really good, then you know who knows maybe uh, maybe that's one that I could get into as well. But that's definitely more of a sixth day edition kind of game for me. Yeah, I, you know, honestly, Brent, until last week, I probably wouldn't have even put this game on the list. Right. Um, several gameplay videos have come out recently. Angry Joe did a 50-minute yeah. uh, gameplay video of it. And now that I'm seeing the gameplay it, videos... It doesn't look bad. No, it doesn't look bad. It's not... It, and that's kind of how I feel about Far Cry Primal, honestly. is I, One thing I would like to see from Far Cry Primal is more gameplay video, sure. too, leading up to... I, I feel like we're not seeing a ton of gameplay and, and media on well, it which is a, Lauren, a little you can, weird you can use a beehive as a weapon is there anything else you really need to know about this game <laughs> um for the division can you i want to see beehive in the division no no well, i can't say for sure that you can't um i don't i, I want to see more gameplay for the division like i said until last week i wouldn't have even put this on here as of late but i watched on the gameplay it doesn't look bad i'm not convinced uh but i i think i think there's there's possibility there and so i uh, like you this is a sort of sit and wait, see how the gameplay videos uh, look, see what the reviews look like. Uh, uh, one thing Angry Joe did say, he, he was demoing it on an Xbox One, yeah. uh, and, and certainly the graphic um, downgrade is, is obvious. And most obviously, in the there's still some great graphics in there. Most obvious was how uh, the streets were less dense. There's some side-by-side -side comparisons out there. But he did say that he did see it running on a decent PC and that the PC version looked fantastic. Right. So, uh, yeah, so, so I'm, you know, uh, cautious. I don't, I'm not even cautiously optimistic at this point, but I'm cautious, but interested. Yeah, I, th I think it's a good place to be. Uh, Hitman, I'm, I'm, more than, I'm more than cautious and interested in Hitman, which, as we said, uh, comes out March 11th, or at least the, you know, the prologue. The first part of it you know, does, yes. The intro pack comes yeah. out on March 11th. I'm probably going to pick that up. I'm, I'm very interested in what they're doing. I like what I've seen so far, and I, I want to check out that game for myself. So that's probably what I'm going to be getting. Uh, I'm, I, not, I'm not going to do the. I'm like I'm not paying the sixty bucks to get the whole thing. I'll pay the fifteen to get the intro and see what I think of it. And then if I like that, then maybe you know maybe I'll move on from there. Yeah, that one's not even on my radar. I didn't really enjoy the last one. Uh, I am. Uh, I'm, I'm. I mean, I'll, I'll look at gameplay videos when it comes out, and it will have to convince me to play it. I'm not. I'm not. That's not really big on my list this year. Right. Uh, the next one, however, is, of course, and that's in, on <laughs> April 26th. I had to look up the date twice to make sure that that was correct. Uh, April 26th is the release of Uncharted 4. <laughs> um, that, uh, I, I'm not going to pre-order it, probably. Uh, well, uh, have they shown, the, have they shown the, uh, the collector's editions yet for that? I can't remember. They did. Yeah, I think, and I I think, think it they was, did. There's a, there's a cool Nathan Drake statue, and I think it's 150 bucks, which I'm not going to do. <laughs> I know that was a struggle. Much as I want to, yeah, I mean, it's a I know if you, I remember, I, you like your plastic statues. I do, and this is a pretty cool looking one. But that's so. I mean, that's a uh, that's a, a no brainer for both of us, right, Brent? I mean, is there what what would it take to not buy it uh, on day on day one? I don't know that there's anything that could stop. I, I mean, basic basically, basically uh, if they say the review embargo isn't up until the day after the game releases, you know, so, like like some sort of like red flag like that. Um. But but short of that, there's nothing that there's nothing that would stop me from having this game on day one. Right. Oh, I, you know what? As a matter of fact, I would probably go ahead and pre-order this, like uh, you know, just get it like through Amazon, you know, so that I have it on. You know, because if you're a Prime member uh, and and you pre-order through Amazon, like they give you release day delivery uh, on your uh, on your games. So right. I, I would probably even do that. Right. Um, I did. I looked up the collector's edition, Brent. There is a statue, but it's not a good statue. I, I remember when I looked up. Nathan Drake statues. I saw another one where he's leaping over a wall that I really, really like. Yeah, but that's not. But the one that they're packaging with the Uncharted Four game isn't all, all that great, in my opinion, and so it's not enough to buy it. But I got you. Um, yeah, so I mean that that's a done deal. Whether I buy it day one or or you know, I, I I never really care about like oh the Golden Gun or any of that kind of crap. Uh, so um, whether I pre-order the game or buy it the day of, I'm, there's no doubt I will buy it. Right. 
So that's April 26th, Brent. So May- March 11th, Hitman. I'm just trying to put it in context. Yep. April 26th, Uncharted 4. Then May 24th, a full month later, uh, the next iteration of Mirror's Edge, Mirror's Edge Catalyst. Hey, now that's uh, that's pretty cool. Um, that is pretty cool. I-, I-, I can't say that I've seen enough on it yet that you know that I'm anywhere near like a day one purchase on it, but I'm I'm pretty excited about that. They're gonna have to fuck that game up from you know to like drive me away from it at this point. Yeah, we did linked out to a five minute gameplay trailer that shows a lot of great gameplay. They've removed a lot of the gunplay, yeah. um, focused uh, more on the parkour, and any combat is sort of hand to hand slash parkour combat. Yeah. Um, uh, it looks great, and I uh, I agree with you. I think they'd have to you know colossally fuck it up to to make me not want to get, get this game. Yep. That's my, which is my true reason. of No Man's Sky. Oh man, of that one. Which, yeah. So that's that's uh, Mirror's Edge Catalyst, May twenty fourth. No Man's Sky. All we know is June. We don't know when in June yet. Comes out June twenty sixteen. We haven't heard anything about VR in that game, uh, and uh, I'm hopeful that they do it in VR. But we haven't heard anything. So they got to. Uh, they got to. I would think so. Yes, but they're they're not saying right now. Uh, they've said maybe at some point, but they're not saying. Um. We'll see what's being said when that comes out because I would love to play that game in VR. Yeah, me too. Um, but uh, that one, again, something would have to go colossally wrong with everything we've seen in the last two years for me not to purchase that game. Yeah, that, that's just you know, it, I don't know. It's just like that's one of those games that like I want to I want to be there. I want to be there. And I want to start playing that game along with the rest of the world and just and just kind of finally see you know just finally see what that game really is. Yep. Um, Coming up in August, so we don't have anything right now slotted for July, Brent. Coming up in August, we have a little title that I think you might be interested in. Oh, yeah. Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Yeah, man. Uh, well, as we all know, I loved uh, Deus Ex Human uh, Revolution, and you did And I love 95% of it. Uh, I love, <laughs> Never having finished it. I love Deus Ex Human Revolution. That was such a fun experience, and I'm I'm very, very eager to uh, to go back and just, just have, uh, have, have more. I'm curious about where they're moving the story and you know it, it's it's interesting because you know the underpinnings of those games become more and more relevant uh, excuse me more and more relevant with every passing day uh and i'm I, i'm i'm really really curious to see you know where they take things in this i think there's some really interesting story ideas that they've talked about but uh, you know just like that fundamental gameplay that fundamental uh you know pick pick your adam jensen and and outfit him with you know the, the the tools to do the job that really appeal to your gameplay style and that uh, that thing of just putting a problem in front of you and letting you figure out how to solve it I love that open ended style of gameplay and I will be more than happy to have uh, another helping of that I I agree with you man and 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 uh, I'm excited that they've addressed what was the biggest flaw uh, in the in the last game I was going to say the first game but not the first, the, yeah, the last game last iteration of De, uh, Deus Ex, which was, uh, you know, the, the outsourced boss battles uh, that felt so yeah. discordant with the rest of the game that required you to fight. Uh, now you can go through the entire game if you want without fighting. It's going to be great. Um, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I, that, that was, uh, I think, their, their biggest flaw in the last game. And uh, they, they have come out uh, very clearly and said that they recognize that, that was, they made a mistake there. And that uh, uh, that they won't be doing that in this game, and so I, I too am very interested in Deus Ex: Mankind Divided, and maybe maybe someday there will be a post mortem on Deus Ex. No, from you and another I. one, but anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> on a Deus Ex game coming. Uh, the next title we have, so that's August, Brent, August twenty third. Right. The the next dated title, and it's not really dated that we have, is slated for holiday twenty sixteen, and that is the next in the Mass Effect series, Mass Effect Andromeda, which. Uh, Hey, I mean, that's uh, that's definitely something you got to pay attention to. Uh, I'm very, very, I'm very curious to see what EA and Bioware end up making out of uh, a post Shepard Mass Effect game. And, and frankly, I don't think that. I mean, I think that's actually something to kind of be excited about, you know, because it's a it's a fresh start. You know, they're they're not uh, they're not tied down by any any preconceived notions of the character or the series or what the story has to be and it just becomes this, you know, this big wide open space that they can explore, and I, I like I like that idea. So I'm I'm actually I, I'm I'm cautiously excited for uh, for the next Mass Effect. I am too, man. I, I agree that I think a post Shepard Mass Effect is really interesting, and and I'm very curious as well to see what they've done with it. Also, how they iterate on mechanics and st- and story setup, and 
that sort of thing. I'm hoping we don't get another like you know what is essentially assemble your team story. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, Do something different. I, I mean, that's that's the whole thing. I love the idea of something different from the Mass Effect series. That sounds it, very it, cool. it's, it still remains one of the most sort of robust and fleshed out worlds that one can occupy in in a video game uh, universe. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm super excited to see what they do with it. I, I'm, I'm not. That doesn't mean I'm not also sort of aware in the back of my head that there's potential to screw it up. But uh, I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that if they do something interesting with it. Yeah. Um, all right, Brent. We have two other games that don't have dates at all. That's just a 2016 release date, which probably means 2017. But we'll talk about them anyway. One of them is Guerrilla Games' follow up from their uh, Killzone series, and that is Horizon Zero Dawn. Which, uh, which, if you remember, yeah. is the sort of uh, Far Cry primal, but with mechanized uh, primal animals. Yeah, in theory, Ish. it's sort of on the opposite. It's sort of on the opposite end of human civilization from Far Cry primal. That's true. It's, it's some you know some distant future post apocalyptic po- kind of thing. S- significantly post apocalyptic. Yeah, where you know the the, the human race is uh, the human race has been reduced to you know essentially living as hunter gatherers again. But in this post-industrial world, or, or you know, this post-apocalyptic world, where all the remnants of our industrial civilization lay in ruins, uh, it's interesting because the, the, this and Far Cry Primal both sit right next to each other in my mind, uh, and, uh, and and I'm very I'm very curious to see what this is. Similar to what we were talking about with Mass Effect, I'm I'm excited about uh, Guerrilla Games doing something outside of Killzone and. And uh, and and having to go, at, you know, just just a new franchise. So that's that's pretty cool. I agree. I'm very excited to see where this one goes. And then, lastly, Brent, one that I'm I'm not too interested in based on my previous experience, but it's on the radar. You were a little bit more interested, and that is Dishonored Two. I know a lot of people out there will be very interested. Yeah, well, you know, the thing with Dishonored Two is that I don't know. Like, I, I did not get into the first game. I didn't play it very much. Yeah, I, I played an hour, maybe two hours at most, and and just didn't get into it. And you know, so many people said that it really actually was a pretty good game, and you know, several people have noted that, like I was saying with uh, uh, Deus Ex, liking that sort of open-ended style of gameplay and, and having the ability to choose, they're like, hey, you like those game mechanics, this game is all about that. And it's one of those games that I keep kind of saying, oh, I should go back and play it, I should go back and play it, and I never do. So I, I do kind of have Dishonored 2 on on my mind as, as a way to maybe, maybe I'll give it another chance and just, you know, pick up this second game and and see what i think about it but uh i'm trying to be open-minded about it even though even though i i I never fell in love with the first game although in fairness maybe i just didn't give it enough time yeah there was a big following for that game obviously so brent i I would be remiss if we're talking about most anticipated games in 2016 if i didn't mention vr yeah we got to talk about the uh, vr maybe because there are there are a, a handful of games that i'm very excited for there's a lot of things I'm very excited for in VR to experience, but there are also a handful of games in VR that I'm just excited about because they look like fantastic games that are going to be made even more fantastic by VR. Uh, by VR, every single one of them. Um, excuse me, that's not true. Four, one, two. Well, all of them are designed with VR in mind. Yeah. Um, several of them are VR exclusive. So I'll start with the two that release with the Oculus Rift on March 28th, uh, and that is Eve Valkyrie from CCP Games, the makers of uh, Eve Online. Uh, this is a uh, space dogfighting cockpit sim. Uh, it's not sim, a space <laughs> dogfighting uh, game. Uh, it's not a sim. Uh, that looks fantastic. And then uh, Lucky's Tale, uh, which comes from Insomniac Games, is, is going to be uh, also shipped. Uh, Lucky's Tale is shipped with every Oculus Rift. E Valkyrie is being shipped with all pre-ordered Oculus Rifts. Lucky's Tale is, uh, people are akinning it to Mario 64, um, which is very similar in style. Which is a big deal. There are people are saying that this could be a like a hardware defining type of game that is yeah um, it looks like that type of game and, and remember again we're putting trailers for all of these games for you guys so you can look at these games um, other games or, I'm sorry Lucky's Tale is from Playful uh, okay Edge of Nowhere which is another game I'm very excited about is from Insomniac I'm games. very I'm very excited about Edge of Nowhere also Edge of Nowhere has this almost like steampunk looking Shackleton type of uh, third-person perspective adventure that takes place in Antarctica. Um, well, I mean, and, and I, it's, basically in the mo- it, it's basically at the Mountains of Madness, the game. And, I, like, I'll, okay, you know, here's my money. Give me... That's exactly right. And we haven't seen a lot from it, but what we have seen looks fantastic. I encourage you guys 
to take a look at the trailer for Edge of Nowhere. Um, another one that looks really interesting uh, is Kronos. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've seen Kronos, Brent, but I, I, that I is, have seen Kronos, and it does look That's very a story good. of a boy. Uh, it's I, I, it, a boy of a boy who's rock giant. A bo- <laughs> kind of. Uh, it, it, it's very uh, labyrinthian. There's a lot of puzzle solving, but it's a boy uh, searching for um, searching for what these things that are causing issues in his world. And but he ages as the game progresses, and as he gets older, his abilities actually change, and what you have to do, yeah. what you're able to do in the game to solve puzzles, actually changes based on the age of your character. Well, you know, we, uh, it, we talked about this game, as I'm recalling, and you know, like the, 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 so we were looking at something like an interview with the dev or something, and they were talking about th- that, that whole idea of, of kind of exploring in the game world that, that loss of vitality that comes as you get older and, and having to deal with that, having to deal with the fact that you're not as fast, you're not as strong, you're not as... Uh, you're not, you're, you're not a, a young man anymore, and 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 you know how you how you kind of deal with that. And I, I think that like uh, that that's just an intriguing idea for game, you know VR or no, that's a really intriguing uh, game concept. So that's definitely one that I'm I'm keeping an eye on as well. Indeed. Um, so a couple others, Brent. Um, Adrift. Yep. Uh, is a uh, again another game that takes place in space. This is a first person perspective. And you are adrift in space, in and outside of a space station. And it looks very, very interesting uh, and creepy. The climb uh, done with uh, the CryEngine is a, we've talked about it before oh, yeah. on the show, is a climbing game uh, that looks muy, um, muy cool. Very cool. Uh, and then uh, the Assembly, uh, which is uh, another game that comes from a, a um, uh, developer called N Dreams, the, the letter N Dreams. Uh, it is uh, going to be for Oculus Rift and Project Morpheus. Um, PlayStation and, VR. Uh, oh, excuse me, PlayStation VR. That's correct. Uh, and is uh, also something of a, of a puzzle-solving game uh, that looks just very, very interesting. Um, so uh, these are some titles, Brent, that I'm looking forward to, not just because they're VR, but because they look like really good and interesting games that I think... Uh, are, are being developed from the ground up on VR and are going to be fantastic titles for this year. Yeah, I, I'm I'm interested in a number of these uh, as well. I, I I love I love you know some of like like we were talking about you know with like the assembly and and Kronos. Uh, some of these games have like a real kind of puzzle uh, aspect to them. Some of them I think more like uh, like uh, the climb and um, and a drift are are more sort of about an experience. You know doing something yep. you know in VR that's very visceral and I think that's very, I think that's really cool uh, I, I'm I'm excited I, I really I really really wish that uh, that I was I was able to uh, to get into VR right at the very beginning because there's already games you know that are going to be coming out this year that I'd like to be playing some of them you know I'll just I'll play outside of VR but uh, as you pointed out some of these are actually did we say uh, real quickly to sum up which one of these games are VR exclusive i think the only ones that are going to be available and and i could be wrong here but i think the only ones that are going to be available outside of vr yeah. are the assembly and adrift okay. uh lucky's tale the climb chronos e valkyrie and edge of nowhere as far as i know are all exclusively vr games okay there you go um and there's also a lot that we uh don't know about yet brent which we're looking forward to finding out in the coming months obviously well. you know e- th- there'll be there'll be plenty of uh, stuff like that to look forward to at, uh, at e3 and beyond All right, everybody, let's hit the road and talk about the games we've been playing this week. Lauren, I'll uh, kick off, kick it off to you first. Yeah, Brent, again, only one game this week. Battlefield 4 uh, did a lot of more social gaming, uh, which I'm totally enjoying. And for those of you that play, although I haven't gotten to play with uh, Alexis, Randy Marsh, Beer, there's a team of, of OGS members uh, that play, and I just I, we've been playing at different times. But yep. I have been playing with my crew and having a great time. Brent, I'll tell you, man, <clears throat> there is nothing. One of my favorite things to do in Battlefield is, is, is ultimately, at the end of the day, is being a, being a dick. And that is, uh, uh, is we, we create these little two- and three-man teams that will essentially take air combat out of contention in the game. So okay. we will just create an anti-air crew with a medic, a supply person who can resupply. A rocket launcher. Uh, 
the engineer and a uh, a rocket launcher. That's exactly right. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, we will do nothing but make matches miserable for chopper pilots. <laughs> uh, because there are, at this point, there are chopper pilots that are so good that they can just dominate. I mean, absolutely dominate a map and go, you know, 40 and 1, 42 and 1. So, and, and you guys have to answer that challenge. And somebody's got to take them out of the game. Otherwise, it's just the chopper decimating everybody. And so, but, and what that means is you end up spending an entire match doing nothing but chasing choppers. And you may end up with five or six kills, but you chip fundamentally change the face of the entire match. Yeah. Because you, you, you basically, even if you're not downing choppers, you make them run and hide yeah. enough that they're not, they're not having an effect on the actual battlefield. And I don't know why it is, Brent, but I get so much goddamn joy <laughs> from doing that. It is just, I, I, I'm not typically like, I, I, I'm not a cheater. I don't go out and get aim bots. I don't like, I, I like killing people and playing the game. There's something about spoiling, pissing on somebody's day when they're chopper pilots. And I think it's, I think it comes from Sado, just, sa- sadism. It comes from sadism. No, no. I think it comes from playing in so many matches where uh, you, you just like you spawn and you get killed by the chopper over and over and over yeah. and over again, and you can never take this capture point because of the chopper. Sweet, and I think I just vengeance. got. I, I think it just got so frustrating that I just nothing gives me more joy than like seeing a chopper spawn, fly halfway into the map, and then launching a couple rockets at it, chasing it back to its hideout, and letting it regroup. And then having it come back and chasing it back and having it come back and chasing it back and just knowing that the guy on the other end of the stick is just going, what the fuck? I can't even get out of my base. Uh, that just brings me uh, just a, a, a ridiculous amount of sadistic joy. Yes. <laughs> so anyway. So it does uh, come from sadism, bow- you admit. Okay. A uh, little Battlefield 4 play, but again, I just, I, I forget when I, I, you know, when I was in Brazil, I couldn't play with friends a lot because my ping was yeah. uh, really, really bad. We were on different time zones, that sort of thing. And, I just forget how much joy uh, is derived from playing video games with friends. It is a lot how much of more fun. fun the game is itself when you play as a team yep. and you're not just lone wolfing it because I, I you agree. just get killed all the time and uh, just just a tremendous uh, just ear to ear grin for hours at a time. It's, it's fun stuff, no doubt. Yeah. So that's all I played this week. BF4. I haven't played much. Uh, it's actually been a really busy week for me, and I, I haven't had time for much of anything other than Star Wars Commander, which I will say has actually been uh, it, it has been fun because it's gotten a lot more social for me, uh, in the sense that we we officially have a squad now. The uh, the Epic Outlaws, which is an Imperial squad. Uh, we've got uh, we've got I can't remember like seven eight people in there now, and uh, and it's cool. There there's uh, there's some people in there that are quite uh, quite a bit ahead of me. I think. I want to say it's Lucius Silver. I don't have my iPad in front of me to check, but I think Lucius Silver is uh, he, he's he's top dog in the uh, in the squad right now. He's got something like uh, I I can't remember like uh, you know like like over like a thousand engagements or something like that. Like I'm I'm in like maybe seven hundreds or something. I want to say like thirteen thirteen hundred or something like that. But uh, yeah, he's he he's racked up some kills. But uh, it's been really really cool to uh, to be playing that game with some of the outlaws and you know people are you, you can request. You can request uh, squad units to uh, to you know like defend your base and everything if you get attacked, and so you know like we're we're all doing that. We're all donating troops and uh, helping the cause and all that. But also just talking tactics and things like that. You know, and, and you know people are saying, well, you know, like this is this is the the makeup of my offensive group that I go into a combat with, and uh, you know, like that's got me thinking about like, oh, you know, maybe I should try you know this, and you know, maybe kind of switching out some of these units. So. That's been a lot of fun. It, it's it, it's made the game all the more enjoyable to uh, to be playing it along with some of the outlaws. Another thing that I I have not played, but I tell you, I came damn close to though. What one thing I I just about uh, did this week is uh, is started playing Swotor again. Uh, there's been a lot of talk. Started, started playing what brand? Star, Sp- Star Wars: The Old Republic. Oh, Swotor. I thought you, for some reason I thought you said Sports War, and I'm like, what the hell what is the that? Hell is Sports War. Swotor, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Swotor. And uh, Rowan sent me a, a message recently, and she just went through this whole this whole thing about, hey, I really think you ought to uh, take another look at Swotor, the, you know, this, this, latest, uh, this latest update that they've done. Of course, there's another one coming up soon, but the, the one from last year. Uh, and she was just kind of running down some of the game mechanic tweaks and stuff that they've done. And I, I read an article on Polygon that was, uh, that was also talking about how like really, it feels like Swotor has finally found that point of balance it wants to have between kind of the hardcore MMO crowd and the people who are more like me that are more sort of like I want a Bioware, 
you know, Star Wars RPG game. And uh, they, they may have finally found a way to make SWOTOR all things to all people and still be a really good experience. So um, I'm very, very, I'm very, very curious about SWOTOR. And I may have updated my game client and I just haven't been able to log in yet because I have to figure out the two-factor authentication app. That may have played a factor as well. Ah, uh, be careful, my friend. You got XCOM coming now right down the pipeline. I know. Uh, uh, so I, I'd have to play Swift <laughs> like really, really quick, I guess. That's right. But anyway, so that's it for me. All right. So not a, not a ton of different games uh, this week, but no. uh, we did get some gaming in. Now, Brent, as we head off into the sunset, yep. man, uh, I, I could not be more excited to share with the Outlaw Gamer Radio listenership uh, as well as Outlaw Gamer Society at large, a video that was posted by our our listener one Lord X. Oh yeah, uh, Lord, <laughs> I can't, I can't. Lauren versus Brent, the Outlaw Gamer Society wrestling spectacular. Spectacular. That's right. Uh, we we debuted this- on Lord X's show Friday Night Fights, which you haven't been watching. You really need to. Uh, this is a. Uh, just about 20 minute video Brent of you and I in the ring wrestling each other with full on commentary by Lord X that is fucking hysterical as, uh, as I said in the uh, in the comments to the video do not spoil it uh I, I'm not gonna I won't spoil it but uh, but uh, my my favorite moment of the vid is uh <laughs> is where he explains it's a one way ticket to Valhalla and uh that uh <laughs> That that is where I broke. I have not finished watching the whole match yet. One of my favorite. So first of all, I got to congratulate you on your agility, Brent. I'm yeah. I'm very impressed. I'm, I'm uh, with your ability I'm spry for a big man to jump around, move around the ring. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite Velocity moments is, where is my I, greatest weapon. Is where I smash you in the face with a baseball bat. It, it was my baseball bat is the problem, <laughs> which is what made it even sweeter. I would say my uh, biggest problem with this video is how tall you are. It's just uh, it's just very unrealistic. <laughs> We're um, almost the same height, and that's just that's just not right. In real life, you mean? Uh, no, no, <laughs> that's right. Um, so I, I think it's fantastic. They're great representations of the two of us. There's outlaw gamer swag, like logos all over the place. Uh, I'm assuming he did this. I, I don't know what version of WWE he did this in. Yeah, uh, he did this in. But I don't know. It, but it's, it's it's fucking awesome, though. It's absolutely brilliant. I love seeing shit like this in video games, like we've seen before. In some driving games, we've seen the logo from EBA or from OGS. Or, yeah. uh, and this is just hysterical, and the commentary is fucking hysterical. Everybody needs to go watch it and comment on it. Lord X, you did a phenomenal job. Thank you for taking the time to doing that. Please don't ever take this video down. Yep, our hats off. Uh, uh, fantastic, fantastic job. So, uh, into the sunset this week. Jesus, Brent, it's going to bring us down again. Is, uh you know, th- there's been a trend recently in in my Into the Sunsets as I've been acknowledging the passing of some some truly uh, amazing human beings and artists, people like Lemmy, people like David Bowie, and uh, the hits just keep on rolling, kids. Because, uh, as I'm sure you're very aware at this point, uh, Alan Rickman, one of the one of the most celebrated, most recognizable, beloved actors. Uh, of of his generation or any generation passed away last week at uh, at age sixty nine, and I, I tell you it was a real it was a real gut punch for me uh, because I had just been watching uh, I had just been watching a series of interviews with him. We were talking about this uh, this play that he was uh, he he had been doing on Broadway, and this. I mean, you know, this is from a while back. Like, you know, he wasn't doing the play uh, anymore. He'd finished his run. But I had just, I had just been uh, watching the series of interviews, talking about this play he was doing and everything, and just uh, like kind of rediscovering uh, just how much admiration I have for him as an artist, and then just you know how dedicated he he was to what he did, and uh, and then it was just, I mean, it was like four days later that uh, that we read that he had uh, he had died. So. I was uh, I was exceptionally not uh, not happy about that. And yeah, this was I. He's a very very talented actor, and in so many movies, oh, of, yeah. you know, both my youth into my adulthood, and just what what a fantastic and, and many as Severus Snape, you know, an entire another yeah, generation. Yeah, I mean, there's like a whole generation um, of people that you know that will know him as Severus Snape. He'll always be Hans Gruber to Lauren and I, absolutely, and the sheriff uh, of Nottingham. 
But uh, and the sheriff of Nottingham, as well as uh, by Grabthar's hammer, uh, Galaxy Quest, dude. If I, you haven't seen it, he was fantastic in Galaxy Quest. Uh, what, like Alexander Dane, I think. I can't um, remember what his name was, but he was he was just he was fun general. I can't remember, but you know, he, he he was absolutely phenomenal. It was a very it was a great movie, and he was great in it. I, I the the day that he the day that he died. I sat there and like I typed it like I found like this like I found like this really nice dramatic uh, headshot of him and I put it into Twitter and I typed the words by Grapthar's hammer by the sons of Warvan you shall be avenged and like I I didn't have the heart to do it because I'm like I can't joke about this you know like as much as I want to like as much as I want to make light of it and all that like I couldn't bring myself to do it because I really was heartbroken Yeah it really it really was a huge loss and then Brent yeah, now this one I have no idea like what I have no idea like how this plays outside of the states. I have no idea like how the Eagles are uh as as a rock band outside of the United States, but the Eagles are they were a big they're a big band uh here stateside and uh and their singer and co-founder Glenn Fry passed away 67 years old. Uh this just happened I mean this was like 2 days ago, right? Like this was like on Tuesday, yep. I think. Yeah. Or was it yesterday? But anyway, um, I guess it was like it was either Monday or or Tuesday. Glenn Fry passed away at uh, at age uh, sixty seven, and that uh, that was uh, that was kind of a shock. And you know the uh, the thing about the thing about this that's kind of I don't know. It's weird for me. I, I don't know. Were you a big Were you a big Eagles fan, Lauren? Well, what's weird, Brent, and I think. In, in or outside the United States, and I can't remember what it's called right now, but there's a fantastic documentary that just came out recently about the Eagles, and I was watching it uh, is, over Christmas. Is this the one uh, on Netflix? Came on, um, I don't know. Is it on Netflix? Well, there's there's one on Netflix called like A History of the Eagles or something like that, but th- there's a couple of big documentaries about them. There's one that came out very recently, and I was, it was on HBO or something like that, yeah. and, uh, and I just found myself watching it, and, and uh, I, I was astounded at how many of these, uh, how many iconic songs came out of the Eagles, and then separately from uh, Glenn Fry Don and Don Hen- Henley, yeah. um, and so the answer is I I didn't realize I was like a, such a huge Eagles fan, but I am absolutely. And in, after watching that documentary, big Eagles fan, I, I realized what an enormous Eagles fan I actually am, yeah. and how woven into the fabric of my youth and America their music is. Yeah, they 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 definitely they cast a long shadow that band and. They, they, I've always had like a really personal connection to them because uh, my dad went to high school with uh, Bernie Leiden, their original guitar player, and also Don Felder, who uh, who joined the band in 1974 and uh, left in 2001. But my dad went to high school with both of those guys, and uh, oh wow! I mean, like, you know, my dad knew Don Felder. Like he he uh, they were. Like I don't want to say that they they were friends, but you know they they traveled in the same circles. They were both guitar players, and uh, my dad was a year older than he was. And uh, you know, I mean, Don Felder used to work at Lipham's Music in Gainesville, where I grew up. And um, you know, so like I, I've always had like a really you know kind of connection to that that band. You know, just kind of knowing th- there was always just that cool fact. We're like, man, like my dad knew these guys, or you know, at least right, some a, sort of personal a, connection. A couple absolutely. of these guys, you know, but. Um, yeah, it was uh it, it was really it was really kind of wild because that was that was one of those that was one of those pieces of music. I mean, you know, you have, like every generation will scorn the next in their music, right? But the Eagles was uh that was one of those pieces of overlap that uh that I had with my dad and and my mom uh to an extent as well. And so it was uh, like that that kind of hit me hard as well. Yeah, it, it really uh, just uh, amazingly talented musician. And yes, Brent, that that is the documentary. It's on Netflix. So if you guys haven't seen it, I highly recommend checking it out. Not that it's going to be on any international version of Netflix, because yeah, that's a whole nother that's a whole thing. Other thing. Um, listen, the, all one right. other thing I want to say here before we move on, okay? Because we have had a lot of downer into the sunsets lately, but on the other side of the circle of life, I would just like to mention the fact that today is my daughter's second birthday. And oh, happy birthday, Zeli! I didn't know. You know, as as we as we are talking about these sad things about you know the, these amazing people and these amazing lives that have now ended, I'm reminded of of you know that that continuous renewal that uh, that we in the human race keep doing because we just can't stop ourselves. Uh, but uh, 
you know, my, my daughter being two years old and I was looking at Facebook pictures my wife was posting from the day she was born when really she was just sort of, um, she was sort of a pink chubby burrito basically. <laughs> and I look at those pictures and, and I look at the, I look at the little girl now who's, who's running around upstairs as we speak, I can hear her stomping around wearing shoes on her hands and clapping and asking to watch her favorite TV show and, and playing letter matching and shape matching games on my iPad and, uh, and just, you know, just becoming this little person. It's, it, uh, it, it really has given me a whole new appreciation for, for life. And, um, and, and it's made me feel more connected to the human race than anything else has ever before. And so, you know, it's not, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not all bad. So what you're saying is you should have used Zeely's second birthday as you're into the sunset. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Happy birthday, Zeely. I did not know. Yep. Um, all right, Brett, we're going to head into the ride along. Uh, this week's ride along comes from Julian. What the, uh, and no, I'm not, not finishing the name. That's where it ends. Julian. What the says, gentlemen, I recently have been getting more excited about the new dying light, um, DLC right. with, with the price increase in response to the content ending up being drastically larger and more involved than the original scope of the project. How that accidentally happens is beyond me, he says, but apparently to the extent that the new map is bigger than the original game's open world, I struggle to find any definitive statement from the developers of whether this is a standalone type DLC or an add-on which requires the base game. Uh, I think it's standalone, but don't quote me on that. And now with the recent announcement that Hitman was, quote, restructured to reflect more episodic release schedule, but still with a two-tier price model, I can't help but feel that there's a huge communication blockade on the part of game developers and publishers when it comes to getting their message across to consumers. Square Enix have even said the adjustments to Hitman came after initial confusion over how much of the game $60 as opposed to $35 would get the player upon release, and what could they expect down the road. Couple that with all existing pre-orders getting refunded to people before any official statement was offered by Square Enix regarding why and, and things don't look so reassuring. This sort of confusion and mixed messages was also noticeably present during the launch of the Wii U and probably led to its dismal sales record. People didn't understand. Was it a new console? Was it a new controller for the Wii? And Nintendo certainly did very little to clear the air. As a result, Buzz didn't build like it did for the Wii, and the newly minted casual gamers didn't know if they needed it, and, and if they did, why? The Wii seemed fine, and very few gave a shit. This all, finally, th that's his, he wrote that, not me, <laughs> leads me, leads me to my ride-along. <laughs> Apparently, uh, a short story long. Uh, do you guys agree that there is a nature of confusion and disconnect between game producers and their consumer base? Not always, but still an alarming amount of the time, especially from a financial business standpoint for publishers that want to sell as many games. And then the trails off. I think he ran out of character space to type anything else. But I wish we, essentially I wish we could he's asking it, stupid character limit thing on comments. if we agree that there's a nature of, con of uh, confusion and disconnect between game producers and the consumer base. Uh, Brent, what do you think? Sure, but it, it, it's by their own choice. I mean, you know, the consumers are talking. The, you know, you go online, you go to you go to forums, you go on social media. You can hear exactly what your customers have to say. Uh, you know, whether you whether you choose to 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 go and listen, you know, that's up to you. And and I don't want to make that seem like you know, like oh, you know, the burden is entirely on on the publishers. I you know, I think that we as fans have uh, we we have an obligation to uh, to speak whether that's with our wallets by you know not doing things like pre-orders or you know giving actual constructive criticism as opposed to you know just posting a, a YouTube video of your game with fail underneath it. But uh, yeah, I, yes, situationally there there is a disconnect between game con game producers and game consumers, but not in all cases. There there are plenty of devs that really listen to their audience. There's plenty of devs who allow feedback from their audience to uh, to make their games better there's plenty of devs who allow feedback from their audience to kill their games so it's uh you know th there's not one rule that applies to all situations but yes yeah, sometimes that exact situation happens yeah there does seem to it does seem to be growing as of late Brent. i mean I, you're right uh, and you said it very well that the consumer base is available to you and it is by their own choosing or by their own mishap uh i'm not sure which is a more accurate characterization of what's happening yeah um, but there, there does seem to be, uh, it does seem to be happening with greater, happening with greater frequency than it did historically. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I, I, in my experience, it's been fairly easy to engage a consumer base. Even when I was a community manager for 
the golf club, which is a, a very challenging community to interact with because they've been a community for over 20 years surrounding video game golf and their knowledge of both the, the actual sport on which the game is based and, and gaming, uh, golf gaming in general uh, is, is incredibly, incredibly deep. And there, uh, um, uh, there can be a significant amount of um, uh, vocal minority uh, who are just antagonistic. It's a challenging, but, but still, in general, straightforward interaction and honest upfront interaction uh, made them very accessible and, and they wanted to be interacted with. And so the community is there if people uh, want to interact with them. And, but yeah, there does seem to be some difficulty in terms of the marketing and PR lately in gaming. I'm not sure where it's coming from, but it's a great, great uh, topic, Julian Wattha. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, and that'll do it for us, Brent, for this week's show. As usual, yes, we want to hear what the community has to say regarding everything we talked about in the show, whether it's the topic that Julian Wattha brought up in terms of the disconnect between producers and the consumer base. What we talked about into the sunset, certainly share your thoughts about Glenn Fry on Rickman. Please go watch Lord X's video of Brent and I. <laughs> wrestling uh i won't spoil who wins for you but it's worth checking out in the road we talked about battlefield 4 and star wars commander and then up in the clubhouse we talked about our most anticipated games of 2016 what do you think of our choices and what are your most anticipated games and why and then of course up in the garage we talked about escape from tarkov homefront the revolution hitman and its new episodic structure and the hottest selling games for 2015 we want to hear your thoughts on all of that and anything related to gaming as usual, he is Brent Adams. I am Lauren Baumgarten. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. <laughs>